A warm welcome to this edition of Aviation This Week on Channel Television. I'm Bukola Ju Okesunbi, and it's good to be back here. On this edition, our attention turns to the cargo subsector of the industry. The International Air Transport Association, IATA, has released new data for global air freight market, which outlines that air cargo demand is stable, but at lower levels than in 2019. While the COVID-19 season lasted, cargo played a crucial role as most passenger planes were converted to cargo planes by leading airlines. Post the COVID pandemic season, especially here in Nigeria, cargo is bouncing back to about 50 to 70 percent of business with a big window opening for exports. A foreign exchange is also dealing a big blow to the sector. This and more is what we serve on the program. But before our background report on the cargo sector, we'll bring you a report on the recently approved 4 billion naira palliative to the airline industry in Nigeria. In 2019, the Nigerian aviation sector became the fastest growing sector in Nigeria in real GDP terms, up 13.2% year on year to 83.5 billion naira from 73.8 billion naira in 2018. The outbreak of the coronavirus in Nigeria is now threatening to derail the fast improving prospects of the industry. The economic cost of the shutdown of air travel is significant for Nigeria. Earlier, the Minister of Aviation put Nigeria's losses at 21 billion naira per month in the lockdown period. In addition, data from the International Airline Transport Association, IATA, estimates that a coronavirus outbreak will cost Nigeria's aviation sector 357.8 billion naira in revenue. 125,370 jobs would also be lost, and the overall economy would lose 318.6 billion naira in form of nominal GDP contribution from the sector. The crisis in the aviation industry is a global phenomenon arising from the need to curb the transmission of the global pandemic across countries. Now, a 4 billion naira palliative is announced for the airlines as the minister attends this public hearing. The federal government has provided 4 billion naira for airlines and 1 billion naira for other businesses within the civil aviation. We are putting criteria for the disbursement of those funds. And uh, once it is done, it will be transparently done and they will be so disbursed. Although this is not the first time bailouts are approved, one of such is the 120 billion naira released to the aviation sector out of the 500 billion naira intervention fund by the federal government in 2011. But this time, the 4 billion naira initiative is generating reactions, and the first is from the Senate Chairman Committee on Aviation. I do not think, sir, with due respect, that 4 billion naira is what we are talking about. Mm. If you look at what is available to airline operators uh, globally, in nations of the world today, if you really want to keep the airline operators in business, and if we don't want them to, to, to pack the planes and send people home, I think the federal government should take up the problem of this industry with all the seriousness it deserves. For many, a bailout should be comprehensive, providing dedicated funding support in the form of loan facilities and tax breaks to support the very fragile aviation industry as the sector would play a key role in the economic recovery process post the COVID-19 pandemic. This is an industry that is bleeding even before COVID. Bleeding that needed a lot of support. And after seven, eight months of COVID to come with four billion naira, and I converted it is eight million dollars. Eight million dollars. Is that enough for one airline to survive? All our staff are dying of hunger. Hmm. Their rents are due, they can't live in houses anymore. The airlines alone have suffered about three three hundred and sixty billion. So what what is four billion to three sixty billion? That's airlines alone. 
How about, how about uh, and what what makes up the airline? How about the ground handling? Because it's part and parcel of airline business. The ground handlers. How about distribution? Where the tickets come from? How about the travel agents? Well, how are you going to share four billion naira? Airlines. Airlines cannot be managed. Mm. We have to do what is adequate. So mm. talk talk maintenance alone. What if they give an uh, give eight million dollars to Arik? The debt we will just swallow all the debts they have, and it won't fill any gap. Error and all all of them are already suffering. They are in receivership before 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 COVID. They are in receivership. Air transport generates benefits to customers and the wider economy by providing speedy connections between cities. These virtual bridges in the air enable the economic flows of goods, investments, people and ideas that are the fundamental drivers of economic growth. The most important benefits from air transport go to passengers and cargo agents and the spillover impacts on their businesses. A key economic flow stimulated by good air transport connections is foreign direct investment creating productive assets that will generate a long-term flow of GDP. Demand for air cargo has rebounded sharply since national lockdowns have eased with strong growth expected for the remainder of 2020. For the International Transport Association, air cargo demand appears to be one of the few bright spots in the global airline sector owing to the transport of medical equipment and essential supplies. Although global air freight requirements were roughly 13% lower in July 2020 when the recovery started, it was nothing compared to 2019 because large amounts of belly freight space on passenger aircraft has been taken out of service. Before the crisis, roughly 50% of air cargo was carried on passenger aircraft. Here in Nigeria, industry practitioners put figures to the face of cargo recovery. Before COVID-19, we were grossing, if you look at our cargo volume, we are doing something like 5 point. 5 million tons and above, you know, during the uh, period of COVID-19, during the lockdown, it came as low as about uh, just a million ton. So you can see the gap of about 4 million ton difference, you know, and, um, but later as the, uh, the month uh, progresses, it started picking up gradually. And as of today, uh, we are not back to that volume that we're having before COVID-19, but Let's say we are doing like 60, 65% as per import. The cargo airlines and uh, even some of the passenger airlines have started coming in, you know, gradually. So I can say, uh, say 55%. So it's not Uhuru yet, but it's good at least. If you go to the warehouses, you find out that uh, you, you don't have uh, that much cargo. But at least we still have stuffs coming in, getting people... Uh, busy. While IATA highlights that air freight will be required to transport a COVID-19 vaccine when it does become available, the global body is also asking governments to begin planning now for its distribution. Beyond vaccines, locally export of cargo at one of the ground handling company was between 400 to 500 metric tons monthly for several years, but had since increased in the COVID-19 crisis. Aircraft capacity is now a key issue. The lockdown and the COVID itself was kind of a blessing in terms of the exports. The government policy itself has always been geared towards more of exportation, less of importation. So as we speak now, we are, we are grossing over a million ton. Before, we were doing like 600, 700 tons, you know, in terms of export. And in the mix, challenges still persist. Of course, we have lots of jobs too which is very evident when you look around, you find out most of the airlines, most of the, even the grand handling companies and even the, you know, uh, subsidiaries, you know, they've all had 
uh, job losses and job cuts, which is also a, wide, a worldwide phenomenon. For many in the cargo business, government should keep striving to create an enabling environment where goods, including perishable cargo, can be stored and get to their destinations quickly. A cargo expert is our guest and he breaks down the activities of the sector post the pandemic season, highlighting how the availability of Forex impacts on business activities. But during the COVID era, during the COVID era and then slightly after the COVID era, we had in fact <laughs> a lot of the uh, importation we're having or receiving at the uh, seaports and airports were medical related items but now I think it has tempered I don't know why but because I think part of it is not because we don't need it is because there is global compet com competition for uh, medical um, where it be it equipment appliances or drugs in itself so I think that's really the challenge and then also the effects I mean, access to foreign exchange and all that. So, and then capacity, because a lot of our business people capacity has lowered because of what happened during the COVID period. Because once you are, when it's importation, once you are buying goods or service or products outside the country, you must deal in foreign exchange, mostly United States dollars. So that is very, very, that's the key. And, uh, and when you do that, even the exchange rate is governed. The government has different, I mean, they've tried to stabilize it now or harmonize it, where even when you're clearing, there is an exchange rate that government fixes for valuing the shipment coming in. So pre-COVID period, it was uh, much more before COVID period was 308. Then it moved to 321, you know, just before the COVID period. Then after the COVID period, it moved to 361. Now we are 381 or thereabouts. So you can see how it's moving. So if you have done your calculation, your clearing cost, your freight charges, and everything denominated mostly in the US dollars, you know, you can see the movement from 308 this year, beginning this year, till to date. Three about three eighty one, so you can see that's that's a remarkable uh, margin, and so your cost is increasing. Okay, most of the time we have to go through the parallel market because if you wait for the normal channel, the the, the requirements, the timing, the questioning, there are a lot, you know. So that is the major issue there. So most of us. In terms of the freight forwarding, custom cargo clearing part, part of the business, we usually uh, go to the parallel market. The challenges we're facing now is not unique to Nigeria. You know, Let me cite an example. In the UK, you have what we call COVID-19 levy. That does an additional charge. You know? On cargo. On cargo, yes. So, and likewise, different governments are building, it, ad, building in additional costs just to make sure that they keep you know, the wheel of progress going. Welcome back. Our special report for this week is next. As a fallout to the coronavirus pandemic, Heathrow Airport is no longer Europe's busiest airport as it has ceded its long-held crown to Paris. The airport CEO, John Holland Kay, said that while Heathrow is in a good financial position to ride out the current crisis, the predicament of UK aviation should spur the government into action. We're a very well-funded uh, company. Uh, we actually have enough financing in place for uh, at least the next two years. And actually, even if we had no passengers, we have more than 15 months worth of cash. So that means we can survive this crisis. 
And it's important that we do because we are the UK's biggest port. And if we're going to help to uh, help the UK economy to recover, uh, which is heavily dependent upon aviation, then we need to be there to, to do our job. Passenger numbers at Heathrow are down 84% in the three months ending September 2020, pushing it to a $1.9 billion loss over the first nine months of the year. The airport said Paris rival Charles de Gaulle had overtaken it as Europe's busiest airport, dealing a blow to Britain's global trade ambitions as the country's current relationship with the European Union is due to end in two months' time. Colin Kay said the government needs to act to ensure the UK and Heathrow retain their global standing. I think it's a, an indicator that if the government doesn't take action to protect our economy, we are going to keep on falling behind. And Heathrow is symbolic of the potential decline of the UK. You know, we, we are the fifth biggest economy in the world, or were before the pandemic. But if you close your borders, then you, your, your, your traders can't trade, jobs get lost here in the UK. And in the meantime, what are the French doing? They are investing in testing capacity. They are growing their global trading network. They're stealing mar a march on the UK. With plans to announce shorter quarantines based on COVID-19 testing to revitalize travel by the beginning of December, the airport chief says testing for airport arrivals need to be expedited and pre-departure testing also explored to increase passenger confidence and ease the pressure on the economy. The airport has cut its outlook for next year's passenger numbers, saying it now expects 37 million passengers, 41% lower than a June forecast, as tightening coronavirus restrictions crush hopes for a recovery in travel demand. Ethereum is owned by Spain's Ferrovia, the Qatar Investment Authority, and China Investment Corps, among others. Now to Japan, where the country's largest airport opened a COVID-19 testing facility as part of plans to reopen international travel that had been halted by the pandemic. The Narita International Airport PCR Center is aimed at outbound travelers who need proof that they do not have the virus before arriving at their destination and comes at a time when Japan is easing travel curbs for nine Asian countries and regions. The lab, run by the Nippon Medical School Foundation, is the first of its kind in Japan and can deliver results in six hours, though the foundation expects to reduce that time to two hours by the end of the month. The tests are not covered by insurance and can cost as much as 46,500 yen. Japan's travel restrictions to battle the pandemic have been stringent with an effective ban on entry by tourists and visa holders from more than 150 countries before a phased relaxation of the measures began in September. Travelers arriving in Japan are required to undergo a test for COVID-19, with three international airports having the capacity to carry out about 10,000 tests a day. The final port is Berlin. This time, the first passengers arrive at the new airport nine years after it was originally due to open. The first plane to land was an EasyJet flight, a special service that took off from Tegel on the other side of the city. That airport will close next weekend. A Lufthansa plane landed minutes later. Construction on the new airport began in 2006, originally due to open in 2011, but construction problems and technical issues saw the dates pushed back repeatedly. The delays left Berlin relying on two outdated and increasingly crowded Cold War era airports, Tegel, which served the west of the city, and Schoenfeld, which was once Communist East Berlin's airport and which has been integrated into the new facility. 
The new airport, which is owned by the German federal government and the states of Berlin and Brandenburg, costs nearly $7.1 billion, roughly three times the initial budget, and is not expected to make enough revenue to pay back its debts, meaning the airport will need grants, restructuring, a strategic investor, equity from its owners, or a combination of these to put it on a more solid financial footing. The Accident Investigation Bureau Nigeria has released four more reports of accident investigation conducted on aircraft mishaps in the country. The latest four reports released include the accident involving a Tampico TB9 aircraft owned and operated by the Nigerian College of Aviation Technology, INCAT, which occurred at the Zaria Aerodrome Kaduna State on September 26, 2018. We've released 54 in total. But since the inception of this administration in 2017, we've released 35 out of that 54, and that gives 64.8%. Under safety recommendations, like I said, we've released a total 196. Uh, since the inception of this administration in 2017, we've released 115 out of that 196, and that gives us 58.8%. Before the end of the year, we'll be releasing an additional three final reports and two safety bulletins to the public. Following the establishment of state task forces on human trafficking, the National Agency for the Prohibition of Trafficking in Persons has been holding a capacity development workshop for members drawn from Lagos, Oyo and Ogun states. At the workshop in Lagos, the Director General of NAPTIB, Julie Okadonli, said the agency is taking this proactive approach to beat human traffickers at their game by involving states so they can be responsible for their indigents at the grassroots. We're to ensure that the perpetrators are brought to book. Those who commit that crime of trafficking in that state are brought to book and to also ensure that the victims are well rehabilitated. So this is the job of the task force, the state task force. The state has a very important role to play in terms of preventing human trafficking, in terms of protecting the victims of trafficking, and in terms of rehabilitating victims of trafficking. Members of the task force also share their experience. Uh, people involved in uh, air, you know, transport, uh, travel agencies, and all that. These are stakeholders that need to be brought on board. And then of course we have traditional rulers in border countries. So for instance, trafficking that goes through border parts are not without the awareness of the community. Nigeria became a signatory to the Transnational Organized Crime Convention and its Trafficking in Persons Protocol on the 13th of December 2000. Article 5 of the Trafficking Protocol enjoins state parties to criminalize practices and conduct that subject human beings to all forms of exploitation, which includes, in the minimum, sexual and labor exploitation. That's our program for this week. Thank you so much for staying with us. I'm Bukola Joe Oketungi.